So it's a, a pleasure to be with you. My, my approach will be to uh, try to spend uh, as much time as I can staying away from the chemicals that uh, many of you might not be too interested in, and maybe not focus on uh, the kind of objectives that might be appropriate for uh, uh, the basic toxicologic class, but a, uh, a world-class approach to it, a sense of how do we float between all the stakeholders involved, and I've heard a, a clearly words from a number of groups of stakeholders. And uh, many of the, these issues would deal, some of the community issues that uh, have been raised here, but the, the Lancet Commission, uh, I guess led by uh, Leo Frank, recently uh, published this piece, uh, it's consequently a slow-burning crisis is emerging in the mismatch of professional competencies to patient and population priorities because of fragmentary, outdated, static curricula producing ill-equipped graduates from under finance institutions. So obviously the global health program here and across the country, uh, focusing on bringing people up to a level to perform within uh, creative standards. I would say my approach to uh, this type of work is to be what many of us would call global. That look before you at the problems that are in this local environment and try to interpret them with regard to a global environment. Try to link the human beings, such as I work at Bellevue. We see a hundred different nations represented every month. Uh, each person uh, brings with him or her uh, problems from a different world. Our job is to try to effectively uh, understand the needs of each individual and that my perspective would be that uh, no person should ever go to an emergency department or a poison center, and so that anyone who arrives there is a failure in the public health system. And so I'd like to give you a few examples and try to look at a big focus perspective. Uh, some of the things I think about as a toxicologist uh, in New York City would be medications that arrive, but these two these simple papers remind us that many medications that people receive either have too much of that which is supposed to be there, too little, or none at all. And that's reported continuously. It could be reported for everything that we go to buy uh, when we're in different countries, as well as right here in this country with regard to quality or the vast number of uh, alternative medications and preparations that people use, or herbal preparations, whether they're uh, those that come uh, for you on Fifth Avenue or those that uh, we can buy in Chinatown. I'd give you a few cases just to see of the types of experiences uh, I think uh, I like to be exposed to and like to many of the young people that I work with. Uh, this is a, an American girl. She was receiving malaria prophylaxis for going to visit her, grandfa her uh, grandparents' funeral of her grandfather in Accra. Uh, she was taking mefloquine, the standard, uh, one of the standard anti-malarial prophylaxis regimens. Uh, the day after arrival in Accra, she went, to, she had a fever. She felt lousy on the plane going over. Uh, and uh, she got to a physician uh, in, a, in a small clinic. Uh, the uh, stepwise approach to life would be to presume anybody with a headache and a fever would have uh, cerebral malaria. Uh, she was given the standard therapy that uh, uh, many, many uh, young children in sub-Saharan Africa get today, which would be uh, artesanate and amodiaquin, another uh, quinine-derived anti-malarial. Uh, one week later, I saw her in the emergency department of uh, the hospital in Accra, and uh, she was blind. Uh, I knew why she was blind, because I'd seen a large number of New Yorkers who had returned from Vietnam who took their full supply of anti-malarials and developed a blindness. Uh, the people who were working in Accra had rarely thought about this because they have so many other causes for for blindness. The question is, what's the right therapy for young children with malaria? This child could never have had malaria. She'd only arrived one day before. But uh, when I go into the, in the countryside, large numbers of children are getting uh, this treatment five times a year to be able to prevent them from developing a disease that's been lethal. Great concern. How do we approach these issues from a toxicological, from a clinical point of view? One thing that was not discussed earlier by uh, and then the talk would be what we consider the leading cause of uh, uh, unintentional death in the United States from poisoning, which would be carbon monoxide. This was a two-year-old uh, girl uh, brought from her home to the emergency department with fever in uh, uh, Conakry in Guinea. And uh, she was treated for cerebral malaria immediately. Her thick smear, looking at the blood very carefully, demonstrated no parasites. Her cerebrospinal fluid was absolutely clear. After some time of uh, resuscitation in the emergency area, she became normal. 
she lived in a home such as this that's, that's demonstrated. Uh, she lay on the floor two days before she was brought to the emergency department with this presumed disease. She had diarrhea, uh, fever, and she was dehydrated at that point. Uh, she probably had an exceptional dose of carbon monoxide, probably leading in the long run to a cerebral deterioration and catastrophic event for her. No one can do a carbon monoxide concentration or carboxyhemoglobin level uh, in sub-Saharan Africa maybe other than in the, some major centers, but rarely is it done, and rarely does it, is it done at the site as opposed to at a distant area. Uh, I often saw across the world 50-year-old um, men or women with metastatic cancer uh, lay on a stretcher with excruciating pain. The patient was given an, uh, an analgesic uh, of limited quality, um, and many, many people uh, because of the fear of addiction, substance dependency, as we uh, are concerned here in New York or throughout America, uh, many people are concerned about that uh, across the low and middle income developing world. Uh, seems to be an inappropriate concern, and large numbers of people uh, obviously succumb to their disease in pain. So Schopenhauer was pretty clear on this, and it's, it's our task. Uh, the, the task is not so much to see what no one has yet seen, but to think what no one has yet seen about that which everyone sees. It's being vigilant for the issues, taking up a cause, de developing a passion for solving the problem as several of you have described in the comments you've made. I'd like just to look uh, from a simple perspective at a small part of, of the, as, as we're dealing with today, a small part of the uh, non-communicable diseases or disorders. About 13% uh, of those who are going to die, less than 70, are injury related. And we're going to focus on that. Remember that this is what all the money's gone to, this 21%. Essentially, 80% of the problems are not being addressed at any qualitative and uh, quantitative level. Uh, if we look at the mortality associated with the, the effect of this injury mortality, suicide is almost 17%. Poisoning is 6.7%. If we think about the number of people who die from overdose in the United States where we invest large amounts of money in organizational process, it's negligible. It's certainly, uh, it's in terms of thousands in the United States, very, very small. The rest of the world we're having it reported, reported is almost a, a very small fraction of the total, but 3 million acute severe poisonings in the world, 350,000 deaths, almost all of them. Uh, in the low and middle income countries. What are they related to? Pretty straightforward. 77% of those reported deaths are going to be related to pesticides. When you look at the suicide rates uh, across the world, uh, there's no data, for example, for Africa. Uh, the data across the world is less reliable. But here you can see as you begin to look towards uh, China uh, and India, you see rates, and, and certainly across the, uh, the rest of Asia, between 8 and 16 and greater than 16 uh, per 100,000 deaths. Remarkable information. You see the converse, on the other hand, if you look for the psychiatrists, psychologists, nurses, and social workers uh, per 100,000 population, you see either data is unavailable or data is so impaired that there's almost nothing. If you look here in China, you look in India, you look in Africa. I, I can think of very few hospitals that I spend any time in, in in those parts of the world that had a social worker. Uh, we have a social worker 24 hours a day in the emergency department at Bellevue uh, dealing with almost invariably uh, immigrants who need public health education and public health uh, literacy is impaired and public health numeracy is impaired. Almost none in their countries. A hospital seeing as many patients as we do in uh, at Bellevue uh, in Accra uh, has no social worker available, no psychiatrist. So what does it mean in terms of comparing uh, the country? Low income countries essentially are off the charts. Uh, there are essentially no personnel in these domains. And here you can see the large numbers of personnel in the high income countries. A great disturbance. If you think about this and you look at any of the health delivery systems, uh, whether it's a physician for every 390 individuals in the United States, and we talk about our inadequate health care system, think about one for every 33,000 in Mozambique, or a nurse for 107 individuals in the United States, 
and one for 2,700 in Tanzania, or a pharmacist for every 500,000 individuals in Angola, and one dentist and 140,000 individuals in, in Ghana. So why is it important? Because you then mesh the concept of suicides and total suicides in four Indian states, farm suicides. I'm uh, going to try to look at the farmer as a particular model of our devastating uh, needs and how we might address them. So of the million suicides that occur during that uh, period of time, about 149,000 are among farmers, disproportionate percentage, about 15% of the total suicides. And when you look at pesticides, it's 20% of the, of the suicides. If you think about it from a political or socio-demographic point of view, uh, the death of the, the farmer. Tremendous numbers. We're talking about weather and drought and water make it tough to farm. Farm subsidies to growers in the U.S. or the EU, large corporations, all lead to farmer poverty, uh, social loss of tradition, social cohesion, and alcoholism, an ever-increasing problem. Farmer failure and depression, easy access to a lethal pesticide, no access to mental health support, suicide attempts, and because the weapons are so readily available, the pesticides, that the high fatality rate occurs. So we think about the same themes, the same themes that I've worked in in numerous countries in Asia and Africa about developing poison prevention services. It's really the unintentional, we don't use the term accidental. Uh, that's a deistic analysis. That essentially, uh, all things can be prevented. Uh, and so that we've got to decide what is our, our entry into the solution problem. Promotion uh, of good understanding, legislation, enforcement of a non-chemical pest control would seem exceptionally consequential. How do we address this to deal with this risk of pesticides? Promotion and the use of safe pesticides. So there's a WHO classification. I'll look at that in a moment. Uh, there are new formulations that one might consider. Then, then there has to be a regionally sound pesticide list for any individual country. Uh, we've got to improve the capacity to store the materials in a safe mechanism to put them away and lock them up. You can see in many countries across the world the materials are lying about, the labels are inadequate, the exposure and the risk for fatality is well understood and utilized all too commonly. A country such as Korea, when we worked on a particular pesticide, herbicide, uh, every intensive care unit uh, had one or two out of their 10 to 20 beds filled with someone who was there on a terminally ill uh, with respiratory failure dying to die within the week with uh, exposure to paraquat, a commonly used herbicide. Uh, improve measures outside the home and to keep things out outside the reach of children. And I emphasize that because that's the right thing to do, but most of the fatalities we're talking about here, I'm discussing here, are really related to adult use of these products. Reduce secondhand containers. Often people put these things back in a uh, container from a soda can or from a gasoline can so they're readily available. Uh, marketing standards that we've used here in America so successfully, uh, very important across the world with regard to kerosene, which is an unintentional cause of lethal poisoning throughout the world. It was a big deal in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s. There were kerosene registries, strategies, and these are exactly the same models we're trying to apply in a number of countries across the world. Utilize poisoning labels. Make sure that people know how to use, who are going to use it know how to use it. And maybe personal protective equipment is a very consequential issue. But that's uh, at a different stage that we'll have to address that. I think that's expensive. It can be done correctly. It needs to be done. But it, this, that's not my priority today. First aid education is consequential. Introduce poison centers at least to offer some of the level of education is necessary. Get regional health services and determine what they can do. Can they render emergency health care? Can they render intensive care? And when you do your grading, just as we've done with regard to site development, what's safe to use in a community that does or doesn't have those resources? And decide on the availability of antidotes. Most commonly, the antidotes will not be available. And by the time the people are seen, not necessarily useful. This is a matrix. Uh, all of us in do, in do anything with problem solving uh, really look at the Haddon matrix. Bill Haddon looked at the vehicle as the delivery of energy when the first National Highway Traffic Safety Leader say, how are you going to protect people who are going to drive it? How are you going to protect people who walk nearby? How are you going to protect uh, individuals? How do you move towards logical approaches? And so you think about what can be done in the pre-event, the event, and the post-event. What's done to the host, the agent, and the environment. You know, putting in seatbelts would be a good example. 
didn't work as well as it should because people had to make a decision to use it, put in airbags. So how do you do that with regard to people who might be having, having a pesticide readily available to them? How do you change the world around the people who are going to use this? So the environment, how to, how to look at the people, who, could, who should be at risk, the people who are impulsive or lethal, lethality of the pesticide. How about drinking? What's the intent? A host of issues and that when you create, you decide you have a problem. Each problem has to be addressed from a systemic perspective and looking at everybody who's going to be involved in the entirety of the community to have an action that's reasonable with regard to this particular agent. So I, I, won't, I will stay away from the molecular analysis. Here's an example of one paraquat, highly fatal uh, uh, when intentional. When unintentional, it's probably also exceptionally high risk. It's only classified as a, it's a class two product by WHO. It doesn't mean that much. It's going to lead to rapid destruction of the cell membrane, uh, the oxygenation of the body, which is typically beneficial in the sense it accelerates the injury. Uh, and the product is, is really considered at almost any level too dangerous to use. Here's an example of a, an older paper, but in, uh, in Samoa, suicide became, was, was a concern. Number of suicides, here you see, pretty stable. You introduce paraquat into the country, and you can see a dramatic increase in 1970s, and by the time 1984 arrived, people, had, this was the legislation to remove paraquat, to no longer sell it, because it was too dangerous to use. It was too easily to access, it was in small quantities would lead to a lethal ingestion. And that uh, in view of the way the country functioned, it was decided it was unsafe to use. This, this is the molecular discussion, and it's not really uh, consequential to, to uh, you to so much. I would look at people have said paraquat is great because it's a uh, herbicide that is not persistent in the soil nor in the plant. On the other hand, it's so interesting from a financial point of view. It's essentially not used in the United States at any concentration that's a great risk to the people. People would like to keep this a functional product because Chevron would like to think this is exceptionally consequential uh, from a financial point of view. It looks as though it works so well. So they've gone through years of analysis to make put in aversive products, to put in a product that makes it so bitter that any child would be turned away. But it doesn't really work if you're a suicidal farmer you ingest it with independent of that. That's subsequently shown. You could say that I put in a, uh, a product that's a, 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 a natural gum that when it touches the pH of the stomach of one, it's going to become a highly viscous mass and it's not going to be absorbed. And that probably does limit the amount of absor absorption. But the quantity of paraquat ingested by individuals is so great that it doesn't much matter uh, how much of that which is ingested is really absorbed. They're going to die. And so that's not particularly useful. Banned in numerous countries, debated in many countries. That's the essential, essential approach that has to be looked at with regard to, to organic phosphorus compounds, organophosphates, the pesticides that most people consider uh, routinely used uh, across the world. So WHO has looked at uh, an approach to the toxicity of these compounds. Uh, and they look at how much if you get it on your skin and how much of you ingest are you going, how sick will you become? And we don't normally do that and say that uh, a product, whatever the product is, the, uh, the lethal dose for a mouse, uh, we really apply that to pesticides. It is almost irrelevant with regard to humans, but that's the way things are rated. And they're, they're rated based upon these classes and what would happen in a standard effort for the World Health Organization would be to look at these data sets and say, here's, this is slightly hazardous, moderately, highly, or extremely hazardous and they group them into these areas and it would be based upon the, the amount a rat could take in milligrams per kilo body weight to decide whether it's really bad. As you know from thalidomide, it's really not what happens in a rat that's so important, it's what happens in a human being. And so that these products are many of those that are available and these lists could be dramatically expanded. They're interesting from if this talk were in front of a group of individuals interested in, in the actual molecular effects of these particular products. But so the issue is that's how they're codified. On the other hand, uh, ironically, as we began to work on some of the things that were just discussed about the, the risk of sarin gas, uh, after the Amshin Rikyo brought sarin gas to uh, Tokyo uh, in their an earlier disaster, uh, less, far less consequential, obviously, than yesterday's disaster, uh, people began to look at the products that individuals used as pesticides 
that didn't really behave the same way they, the others did. And the concept of sarin gas being consequential and uh, a sequel of the, the Nazi experimentation and development, certainly there were many of these products that were considered standard pesticides that had totally distinct characteristics and different methods of action, as did their vehicles in delivery. But when you give someone an organic phosphorus compound, it's not just there as 100%. It's going to the, the other products that are there are exceedingly toxic as well. And the interactions are probably consequential. So understanding that these products, all sitting on the list in different categories, really don't at all fit into those same categories. And that the, the standard WHO approach to looking at the toxicity is almost irrelevant with regard to human beings. So what's been done here are three examples that uh, can be found. There are obviously many more. Uh, the idea that in, in Bengal, India, in Jordan, in Rosario, uh, that these various pesticides were banned because they were found to be too dangerous for the population involved. I won't spend time on this. This is really shows what happens when our standard acetylcholine meets this molecule, this enzyme structure, acetylcholinesterase. But that's where the toxin acts and alters the capacity of us to, to do things normally at the motor end plate. The complications, and I would just use it as an example, dimethoate is one example, uh, dichlorvos another. Uh, these products don't behave the way we normally think things are going to happen. We usually say about organic phosphorus compounds that people have uh, an acute uh, cholinergic crisis, salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, emesis. Those are the hallmarks. But many products have distinctly different characteristics uh, that are quite devastating in nature. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the effect uh, is going to be a lack of motor function. Sometimes it's going to be uh, a, law, a delayed manifestation. Sometimes it's going to be exceptionally rapid. And I, I don't think I'll focus on these for this particular group. Um, but that the future research really has to address, maybe you just have to eliminate class one and two pesticides. Maybe they shouldn't be produced. They shouldn't be uh, permitted in any country. They may not be necessary at all. There's very little evidence for that. And we have to have an understanding that if you have a product available, there has to be a mechanism for people to treat those who inadvertently or intentionally uh, take that particular product. Uh, we have to uh, have a definition of research to determine toxicity, and it has to be sophisticated prior to the use and marketing. And then there has to be a post-marketing surveillance mechanism to determine what happens. Those should be the standards for anything of this nature. There has to be a, a sense, is there an antidote? Should if you're going to have a particular type of pesticide, for example, you, maybe you must have an antidote available to reverse that, the one that a community can afford. If you have to buy your own medications and you're living in most of the world, you will not have enough money to buy the antidote that we consider standard for this pesticide, something called pralidoxime. It's not clear that pralidoxime is good for many of these. It's not clear that it's necessary for some of them. But it's clear that most people can't afford that, particularly those who have ingested it. So we need to study that substantially more about the types of interventions we might have. We need to consider that there would be new regimens to approach uh, pesticides that might be more rational. It's not clear that they will be. And usually when something that is effective enough to kill an insect or a very resistant organism, uh, you run into difficulties. And so we have other approaches. Uh, the commonest one we use in the United States would be pyrethroids chrysanthemum derivatives, uh, the natural product being pyrethrin, and pyrethroids are a, uh, a manufactured, a designed molecule, it's quite similar. It's not clear they'll be good enough, but it's clear that we have to investigate that. We have to find a way uh, when using any pesticide to consider decreasing ab absorption. We have to find a mechanism to inactivate the pesticide uh, when ingested, if that's the case. We have to find a mechanism to eliminate if that's a, an appropriate solution. Uh, we have to think about whether farmers can safely use uh, these products without proper training, which seems to be the standard, and without resources for something that's highly toxic. Uh, how would one do it? There are many ways to approach it, whether it's occupational safety, whether it's uh, personal protective equipment, whether it's pictographs, or whether it's a uh, lack of ability to use it except with people who are exceptionally well trained. Uh, integrated pest management, a totally different approach 
thinking more clearly about what we need to do, what people in other countries need to do, and how to create centers of excellence to clearly look at this. It's important to remember that the thoughts that uh, I might have sitting at uh, First Avenue in New York would be distinctly lacking in utility if I were to consider what happens in a low to middle income uh, country. We need really operational research to determine whether, what's the evidence about something be effective uh, to be implemented. As opposed to taking a strategy, one has to go to the site to determine what is acceptable for the community, as uh, many have said already in the comments. How should pesticides be regulated when the information available is inadequate to act? That applies to the United States, it applies to the world. Most of the pesticides we use, we have little information of actually how they work, what the risks are associated with them, and what the potential is for treating people should they either unintentionally or intentionally ingest the product. So our commitment to global health is the same commitment that we should have in our own country for everything that we see that's wrong. We have to have an ad advocacy spirit for injury prevention. We have to scale up interventions. We have to decide that something's safe. You can remember Ralph Nader saying something was safe, unsafe at any speed. We have many products, medications, and uh, interventions that are probably unsafe under any circumstance. We need to improve the research environment for products of this nature. It's not, uh, th there's no support for this. There's very little support for this in most areas. Generate and share knowledge. Immense financial commitments need to be placed to understand this. The battle against the immense financial commitments of those who want to use these products. Expand and enhance the trained workforce. As I started the discussion about uh, the Lancet Commission's effort. You need investigators, you need workers, you need people to think about this from an economic, a social, and political perspective. Uh, institutional support for infrastructure management and technical support. Very little of that exists in most of the countries in the process of development for the reasons we've been suggested with regard to lead, uh, uh, utilization of lead or what the oil industry and obviously agriculture uh, is an immense industry everywhere, whether it's on a large scale or on a personal family scale. Engage in respectful partnerships with national and international organizations to address issues that would be very sensitive. From the uh, public health service perspective, uh, we need to monitor uh, the health status to identify and solve community health problems. That's been discussed already. Diagnose and investigate health problems and hazards in the community. Uh, sometimes you look at large populations, uh, sometimes you look at individual cases. Uh, my perspective as uh, running a poison center is that uh, every single case is consequential and when you do the investigation you find many other people are affected. Uh, the, the quantity and the number and cr is often difficult to determine, but the development of poison services are essential because what you then do is you have an advocacy group, whether it's like the Consumer Product Safety Commission, where it's like the Environmental Protection Agency. The poison service is looking at the allowing an individual to speak up for an event that he or she has seen. Doctors do it all day long. In this city, we're going to get 400 calls at the poison center, half come from doctors, about something that bothers them that they don't have any place else to get free information that's meant to be altruistic and meaningful to that particular individual who's calling and the patient that he or she is representing. And so that these are, we're, we're looking for single individuals. We use this kind of system as a big biosurveillance force in the United States today for, for if there are three people in the United States who happen to turn pink with green polka dots, uh, that comes up on our surveillance network and we would know that that one's found in San Diego, one's found in Omaha, and one's found in New York City within several minutes of that occurring because they're all online. It allows us to respond to new diseases, whether they're uh, developed uh, naturally or whether they're unintentional events or whether it's a terrorist event or it's a new malady. So we need to inform and empower people about health issues. Education is essential. How do you do it? Uh, that's public health strategy at the top of any list. Mobilize community partnerships and action to identify and solve health problems. These are all based, the environment is a great way to start. Develop public policies and plans that support individual and community health efforts, enforce laws and regulations that protect health and ensure safety. Link people to needed personal health services and ensure the provision of health when it's otherwise uh, unavailable. Ensure competent public health and personal health care workforce. Training people to think about the issues effectively is what your global health programs are meant to do. 
how to solve the problems that others have neglected or others have not understood. Evaluate the effectiveness, the accessibility and quality of personal and population-based health services. And research for new insights and innovative solutions to health problems. Train people to work on the things that no one else was interested in. Train people to investigate and, and energize a community-related action force. This is, comes out of the Frank uh, and uh, Lancet Commission, sort of the big link between education systems and health systems, that there should be a continuous flow between the two and that the population should be represented and there should be an essential understanding of the creating a labor market for health professionals. Uh, one of the recent courses we've been working on at uh, the University of Ghana is to try to create a sustainable workforce for masters and public, masters and PhD candidates so that they believe they can do the adequate research by linking as many universities do with Fogarty uh, grants to try to gain enough strength so that people don't leave and people work on these issues. Uh, for we both will learn, both countries, both worlds, uh, will learn an immense amount by having that kind of collaborative effort and looking at the problems. Uh, and it, in many ways, the idea that there will be uh, several children who will die in uh, Ghana today uh, from kerosene ingestion, we looked at that same problem many years ago. That's an inexcusable reason for death. They, it will be uh, probably the result not of the kerosene primarily being ingested, which we learned in America. In America, we used to treat people giving them the syrup of Ipecac to make them vomit that up. In Accra, some child in a few minutes is going to ingest kerosene because it's everywhere. And then the mother is going to give palm oil to make the child vomit. And when the child vomits, that's going to be aspirated and destroy the capacity of that child to breathe. We learned that. How do we learn to share it in an egalitarian way that's going to change the course of that child's life? So I didn't have to say that today. Virchow said that uh, 150 years ago. Medicine is a social science, and politics is nothing more than medicine on a grand scale. Physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor, and social problems should largely be solved by them. You need activists, committed, dedicated individuals. So that if Magritte were working on public health and public policy, he would say that clarifying a shared vision for success is essential, that articulating the theories of action is an absolute mandate. Acting purposely while collecting data is essential. Analyzing the data in a collaborative fashion amongst all the stakeholders in a community and ultimately using informed team action and planning will create a mechanism to deliver success in addressing some of these complex problems. Thank you.